Hello everybody, today I wanted to talk about some of my thoughts on a book that I've just finished reading. It's the first volume in a three volume work on uh, biography on Stalin. Uh, quite accidental that I even came across this book. I was watching an interview with about with Thomas Sowell about his latest book, um, the Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, and in the sidebar, it showed the same interviewer, uh, who's the guy who does all the interviews for the Hoover Institute, um, had interviewed somebody about uh, Stalin. And I actually remember very clearly hesitating about clicking on the link, thinking, yeah, I kind of know. I, I didn't think I knew everything about Stalin by any means, but, you know, I kind of thought, yeah, I probably have an idea what the gist of that would be. But I was bored, so I went ahead and clicked on it. Well, it turns out that it was an excellent interview. The author, um, it was a professor, I think, at Princeton or Stanford or someplace on the East Coast, and had actually lived in, in Russia during the end of the Gorbachev era um, in actually Magnitogorsk, which is one of the big cities that Stalin sort of founded uh, during his big collectiv collectivization plan. So this guy had a lot of very interesting things to say uh, and a, a interesting approaches to um, biography and to Stalin in particular. And I went ahead and looked, and for those of you who maybe don't want to read the book, and I'll show it right now, here it is, Stalin by Stephen Kotkin, and this is just volume one. Volume two and volume three uh, have not been released yet. I think volume two will be released sh soon. Some of the interviews made it sound like he was more or less almost done with that part. Volume three, I don't know. So this volume goes from, it talks about, and it's very interesting, uh, like, this is an excellent biography for people who like general history as well, because he views that as a necessary component of this, that you have to understand more or less the times that someone is. So he goes into, you know, Tsarist Russia and the birth of Stalin. You know, obviously there's not a lot to say about a, a little boy, but it just gives you the, the details so you know what those are. Um, his early life, what the political climate in Tsarist Russia was, and this goes through... World War One, the, the the revolution, of course, the first revolution, which was not led by the Bolsheviks, but was, uh, you know, led by the more centrist government under Kerensky, and then the later Bolshevik Revolution, and then the Civil War, and it ends in 1928. The next volume, I believe, goes from 1928 to 1932 or 1933, which I think is interesting that a whole volume is dedicated to just those years. But I think the main reason for that. Is that's the period of like high Stalinism where he was really trying to make things the way he thought that they should be, and then I presume the next book will cover from thirty-three until fifty-three when he died. Um, and there are a lot of interesting things. Uh, if you go on YouTube and you type the, uh, his name, Stefan Kotkin, that's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-K-O-T-K-I-N. Um, you can find probably five or six hours of interviews of him talking mostly about this book. And I find that uh, although he does retread some things, they're not that redundant. And I've actually found interesting things in all the interviews that he gave. Um, so one thing is he doesn't believe that people are necessarily just uh, deterministically victims of society that, that they're within, that individuals and their force of will can actually have an effect. And he goes into great detail on how he thinks that can be demonstrated with uh, Stalin's actions, where Stalin did, did things that made no sense in the context of the, the thrusts of history. Um, he also had an interesting approach of, he, he says there's, with someone like Stalin, there's a lot of, um, after the fact, uh, reminiscences about his childhood, you know, so somebody in the 1950s who has fled the Soviet Union might tell a newspaper in the United States, oh, I remember when Stalin was a boy, you know, we saw him, uh, you know, do sadistic things to a cow or to a dog, or his father used to beat him. And that's why he's such a bad guy. And basically, this author says when stuff is recorded in a non-contemporary fashion, so even if the person who's saying this was actually there and was a witness, if they are reminiscing about it many years later, he says, you know, they could be wrong, they could be, their memory could be faulty, and they also could be imputing, you know, things that happened later into the past. And he's not saying necessarily that those reminiscences are false, just that he doesn't put a lot of weight in them. 
Uh, and he says, if you look at contemporary sources, for instance, um, you know, there's a lot of later allegations that Stalin's father beat him. But if you look at contemporary, you know, people writing at the time, whether it's Stalin's teachers or close relatives, there really isn't any evidence that that ever happened. Now, that's not to say that it didn't, but he's saying, look, we don't really have anyone at the time saying this was a thing. Another thing that I thought was interesting is he said a lot of people will then say, and to use the same example, uh, well, obviously, you know, the reason Stalin became this horrible dictator is because his father beat him. And then uh, the author uh, kind of jokingly says, well, my father beat me and I didn't become, you know, a dictator killing millions of people. So uh, to offer that as an explanation of how Stalin became the way that he did is not a good analogy. And one of the very interesting things about this book is he points out that through his life, even though Stalin had many enemies and many people who didn't like him, he had lots of people who were close to him, and those people did not seem to be worried about him being a psychopathic, paranoid, schizophrenic leader who was going to be liquidating people by the millions, which as he turned out to be. They didn't start to feel that way until his dictatorship was well established and he'd been in power for some time. And this guy is of the opinion, rather, I, you could interpret that and say, well, he always was that way. And he just waited until he had supreme power. Um, but he's, his view is, is that the fact that you have dictatorial power is probably going to change you and bring that stuff out. Although, I guess he said you can't prove it. So, a very interesting kind of take on, on what he's going to consider, what sources he's going to put. And, and he will talk about some of those reminiscences, but he'll also qualify them like, look, this person is saying this many, many years later. You know, they could be remembering it wrong. They'd be telling the reporter. They could be telling a Western reporter or a Western government official something that they think they want to hear. Um, this definitely happened, by the way, in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, at, at some point, uh, Stalin had biographies written about him, and some of the people who would write them would basically put in their things that they thought Stalin wanted to hear, and then he would then say that's incorrect or whatever. Um so very, a lot of information in the book, and it really clarified a lot of things. I know in my kind of fuzzy understanding of the Soviets' rise to power, there's a lot of things that I didn't know. So I always kind of assumed, well, okay, Lenin got them to power, and then after Lenin died, there was this huge power struggle between Stalin and Trotsky, and eventually Stalin was victorious. And what this book makes very clear is that that never really happened, uh, that uh, Lenin appointed Stalin the general secretary of the Communist Party. Uh, so actually not a position that was directly in the government, although Stalin had other positions within the government. He was in charge of the various nationalities, like coordinating between them. But this was a, 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 a position within the Communist Party. Well, a month or a month and a half after, and Lenin specifically created that position for Stalin. Um, Trotsky was by far the more famous uh, uh, subordinate under Lenin. During the Civil War, he had headed up the Red Army. He was a more famous theorist. He was better known in the West. More people in Russia would have known him. He would have. He was a much better known figure than um, Stalin was. But he wasn't that savvy when it came to politics, and he wasn't really that interested in personal power. He was um, a pitiless Bolshevik, you know, someone who would, you know, annihilate class enemies as he saw them, but wasn't too interested in having power himself. Um, now, about a month and a half after Lenin created the position of general secretary of the party for Stalin, Lenin had a massive stroke. Lenin had been in ill health for a very long time, had many different ailments, probably more than we know about. And this stroke basically incapacitated him. He still was able to sometimes talk and to sometimes write, and there were periods where he got a little bit better, uh, and was able to travel and even give speeches, but he had, I think, total of four strokes uh, in the year and a half that he survived after his first one. And Stalin was basically in a position of enormous influence and power from that point on. Now, the stature of Lenin within the regime was such, and I think the personal uh, esteem that people like Stalin and, and Trotsky had for Lenin, and apparently Trotsky had, or Lenin, Stalin had a great deal more esteem for Lenin than Trotsky did, um, was such that even though he was largely incapacitated, nobody tried to coup him, nobody tried to get him out of power. It seems very evident that um, 
all these people really wanted him to stay in control, that he was that much of a figurehead. In fact, later towards the end, Lenin started asking Stalin to bring him poison so he could commit suicide, and Stalin actually didn't do this. So if someone was trying to, you know, coup Lenin or get him out of the picture, um, you know, Stalin had a perfect opportunity to do that at that point and didn't. Uh, and, but he, he declined and eventually died. And when he did, you know, de facto, Stalin became the person who had the most power. And there were other powerful people, uh, Kalinin and Bukharin and, and, you know, a host of lesser people. Trotsky's the most famous again. But none of these people had really influential positions at the center of the state. They weren't in positions to create, um, you know, a network of spies or, or adherents. I mean, you had local people. The, one of the one of the high ups was you know in charge of Leningrad and had a big network of people in Leningrad, but not beyond the rest of the country. And Stalin did that. Uh, a few of these people at one point met in secret, t realizing that Stalin looked like he was going to end up with pretty much all the power. And basically, they decided that there was nothing they really could or really should do. Stalin wasn't giving indications that he was going to turn out the way that he did. And as far as everyone knew, he just seemed like a dedicated worker who really believed in in Bolshevism. And, and and Marxist Leninism, and so there never really was any struggle against his dictatorship. Uh, he didn't have complete control at that point. There was still a lot of, you know, a lot of times he would have to go through the process. The the various um, bodies would have to vote or whatever, and he would have influence in these bodies, but they not might not necessarily vote the way he wanted axiomatically, but. Within a few years, uh, Lenin died in 24, I think in January of 24, um, by 1928, Stalin was basically in a position where he was a true dictator, and that's when he ends this book, is when he decides to collectivize agriculture. Um, and I, to be honest, like I, I was not aware that that's how it unfolded. The other thing is he talks a lot about is the so-called Testament of Lenin. A lot of people have heard of this, where supposedly Lenin on his deathbed or near his deathbed um, told people that Stalin should be removed. And he goes into great detail about the authenticity of these, these claims, where they come from. Um, so Lenin had his stroke and his ability to communicate fluctuated a lot. There were times where he could talk, where he could write, but eventually he lost control of his right hand. He lost the ability to speak. Uh, you know, he quotes extensively from the medical records, and there are times where his eyes are glazed over, and he's basically just almost a vegetable, or he would just grunt or shake, and you could tell that he was frustrated and wanted to say things, but really couldn't. And this was towards the end of his life when his ability to communicate at all was very unlikely, and all of a sudden his wife, a woman by the name of Krupskaya, who'd been with him for many years, comes out, and she's has this thing that later got called the testament, although it wasn't called the testament at the time, but basically a, an alleged dictation from Lenin, basically saying it named several prominent communists and point, pointed out problems with all of them, but said that uh, Stalin was rude, among all things, and that he should be removed as the general secretary. Um, now, there was no Often, uh, Lenin would initial that he, you know, the dictation had been taken, and there was no initial. So that doesn't prove that it wasn't, because he may not have been able to. But it's very, it's, it's. You can't prove that this document basically was a dictation of Lenin. It's very hard to know. And he goes into, well, what did, what do we know about Lenin's thoughts about Stalin? Well, he obviously thought enough about Stalin to give him a position of extreme power, basically enacting Lenin's will through the rest of the party was what that was. And when Lenin was gone, it became enacting Stalin's will through the rest of the party. Um, he probably wouldn't have done that if he thought really lowly of Stalin. However, there were times where he did complain about Stalin and said you know negative things about him. So it really isn't uh, here nor there. It's hard to prove either way. Um, but what's interesting about it is with the prominence that, you know, I've heard of this without even really knowing that much about the Soviet Union. Um, this, as it was later called, Lenin's Testament basically never left. And the reason was that the, the zeitgeist and the legitimacy of Stalin's dictatorship was based on Leninism. He put himself out there as, I'm Lenin's chief pupil. Now, uh, this is opposed to someone like Trotsky, who kind of put himself on the same level as Lenin said, well, Lenin was a theorist and I was a theorist, and sometimes I was right, sometimes Lenin was right, and sometimes Lenin was wrong. 
Stalin took the a view of Lenin is always right, and I'm just trying to uh, keep going with his legacy. Le uh, Stal Lenin, because he died relatively soon after coming to power, many of the things that later happened, many of the frustrations, many people in, in Russia had hopes that socialism would deliver all these promises, which are the same promises that people today find so appealing about socialism. And after he died and those promises were never realized, it was easy for some people to say, well, it wasn't that socialism was wrong, uh, Lenin was a great guy, um, and they were able to blame these problems on later people. Uh, so he became kind of like the George Washington, the, you know, the faultless, perfect founding father of the of this new Bolshevik state. And because, But because Stalin placed so much of his legitimacy on his connection to Lenin, Anything from Lenin that questions his legitimacy became that much more important. The other thing, and another reason why the importance of Trotsky in a power struggle with Stalin is something that a lot of people believe, and is what I believed as well, is because in order to solidify his power within the state and within the country, Stalin needed internal enemies, and he really didn't have any that could challenge him in terms of controlling the government. Obviously, there are many people in Russia who didn't like Stalin and who would have killed him if they had had the chance, but mostly they were peasants and they were in a position to kind of wield the, the powers of government, the levers of government. So he needed a Goldstein-esque figure to basically blame everything on, and these eventually became Trotskyites. Uh, in, in the international community, you know, they said it's the uh, uh, financial capitalists, the financial imperialists, and within the country, it's the Trotskyites. There were different enemies also, but that was the main one. And he he basically elevated Trotsky to a position, a sinister position of of, of opposition, of, of ruining the economy that he really never had. Um, but in doing that, he kind of gave him more importance than he really ever earned or really deserved um, because he needed an enemy. It's very, in fact, it probably is the inspiration for George Orwell's um, Goldstein in 1984 because uh, it kind of matches that almost identically. And I think uh, Orwell is pretty well aware of that situation. So that's probably where that actually comes from. So it was interesting. So another thing, and I think kind of the main the main kind of insight of his books uh, is that a lot of people today like to disown Stalin and be like, he's not a communist, he's not a Bolshevik. The USSR is not so is not is not socialism, it's not communism, it's been bastardized, it's this horrible thing that's not what we intended it to be. And I've seen, I mean, some guy, I saw it was a lecture from a prominent leftist that at some point somebody sent to me like, here, this is, you know, what we really think. And it was interesting because he said, well, Marx thinks that you take over the state and then you use the state to achieve socialism and then the state dissolves away. And Stalin said that, well, now that we now that the state is socialist, we have achieved socialism, even though we still had a state. Ergo, it's not true socialism. I think that this is kind of a silly kind of critique because what you're saying is okay, so it's not true. You know, you could say that Stalin isn't a true socialist because they ha or they haven't achieved true socialism, but Stalin is still taking one of the necessary steps to socialism, right? So it's like, yeah, he says all those mass killings. That's not. That's not socialism. That's just one of the steps you have to take to get to socialism, which is just as bad, basically. It's kind of an interesting argument that people come up with. But one of the insights that he brings forward is that um, Stalin definitely was a believing socialist. He believed in the works of Marx and of Lenin. He read them constantly. He used them as a template for all of his actions. He did things that were clearly based on that ideology and had no other... Um, basis. And he talks about his desire to collectivize agriculture. A little bit of background here. Um, you know, Russia had just gotten out of serfdom, you know, 50 years before this. And the agriculture of Russia was basically run by small farmers, what we would call peasants. And some of these peasants, the more productive and the better, the, the, the smarter, the ones who worked the best were becoming a little bit richer than the other ones. And they were producing most of the grain and Russia for many years was the breadbasket of Europe. They were not only feeding their own population but exporting grain and feeding populations in many European countries including England and Germany. And with the with World War One and the Civil War after, um, you know, the, all of these dislocations reduced the amount of uh, 
agriculture that was done and then the amount of exports were greatly reduced and the Soviets took over but the Soviets were based very strongly in the cities they were supported by the proletarian by the workers not by peasants this is kind of the opposite of which happened in China in China um, it was really the peasants who helped the communists come to power uh, against the cities and the capitalists and the workers in Russia it was the workers um, ruling over the peasants well early on Lenin had tried to uh, create the Marxist uh, agricultural armies, socialized agriculture, and it hadn't worked at all. The peasants wouldn't stand for it. And rather than have starvation and lose any way to export grain, which was the only way for the Soviets to kind of get foreign capital and foreign technical ability, technical expertise, they abandoned socialism for what they called the new economic policy, which basically was a market economy when it came to agriculture more or less and to allow people to become rich uh, and to allow some peasants to do better than others then they gave a, a derogatory name for these people they called them kulaks which i'm sure many people have heard that term before and this was a tactical retreat uh lenin said yes obviously the new economic policy basically a market um, is not the end game of socialism but it's okay to make tactical retreats ideologically you know the end goal is the same but if it makes sense for you to do this and london was famous why cheat still you can make an agreement you can make a peace with another country that's fine you can break it as soon as you desire you can be as faithless as, as you want to be to get your goals um and but then people like trotsky you know they believe this as well they said yeah eventually we'll have to transition to collectivized farming but that will probably take at least two or three generations. It will take something like many, many decades. It's not something that we can do right away because they knew that the peasants were not. The peasants did not. The peasants understood incentives. Okay, they were basically telling, collectivizing would entail telling all the peasants you have to work much harder, but you won't get any kind of increased reward for working harder. All the surpluses that you're going to create are going to be expropriated by the state for the state's purposes, both to feed the urban population and also to export so that those exports can be used to finance industrialization. Uh, and Stalin was very explicit about this. He actually called it tribute, that the the peasants are going to have to be milked for everything that they're supposed to, they're going to be made to work as hard as possible uh, and be given as little as possible so that we can you know take the 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 surplus labor um and use that to uh you know finance the industrialization schemes that we had going on and that's just the way it has to be and many when he said this is what we're going to do basically everybody all of his advisors all the other powerful people said that is not going to work you're not going to get more harvest because of that because the peasants will just they'll become shirkers they'll you know whatever they'll sabotage they they won't you can't make them work hard enough to make right and this is exactly true what ended up happening uh one of the in this book isn't heavy on statistics uh but the number of like livestock in the soviet union from 1928 to like 1929 when stalin instituted collective tried to force collectivization they plummeted by either a half or two thirds, depending on the animals. People would just kill rather than, well, because why? Were you going to work hard so that the state can just have your cow and take all the milk? No, you just fuck that. And you just kill your cow then. You kill your pig, you kill your horses. And the numbers of those animals dropped by, you know, again, a half, two thirds, you know, something like 35 million horses became like 10 million horses. Uh, in places like Kazakhstan, the sheep herd went from, she, sheep is big out in Kazakhstan. You know, the sheep herd dropped by almost 90% of peasants like, no, we're not going to do this. The, the amount of grain that was produced completely plummeted. If you look at exports, the exports of the Soviet Union in 1928 were less than a third of what they were in 1913, the last year of, so of Tsarist Russia before the Great War happened. Um, and that's actually another really interesting rubric. And if we ever read Sutton's work, Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development, you find that they use 1913 as like a base year. What was, you know, in 1925, how much, you know, what what is industrial output in 1925 relative to 1913? And the Soviet Union in the 20s and all the way up into the 30s, uh, 
was usually only a small fraction of what it was in the 19 in like say 1913 under the Tsarist times. And this kind of brings me to another point. A lot of people today will admit that Stalin did all these bad things. Now a lot of communists will say he's not really a communist and that's completely false. He honestly completely sincerely believed in communism, Marxism and Leninism and that he did things specifically for that. By trying to collectivize agriculture the way that he did, he endangered his own dictatorship because he greatly weakened the financial resources of the country, he greatly re reduced the food resources of the country, and he caused a huge upheaval. Everyone in the government besides him opposed this. The peasantry opposed this. You almost had a civil war for, you know, he didn't make him, his own position stronger when he tried to collectivize agriculture, but he did it because he believes in the ideology of socialism. And he believed he had to do this. But you have people who will either deny that he's a communist, but they'll also say, yes, 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 he did all these bad things, millions of people died, but it was necessary for the Soviet Union to industrialize. And, and a lot of people will specifically say it made it so that they were able to, you know, win World War II against Nazi Germany. Uh, first problem with that is, what's the, what's the, what's the price that you're willing to pay to win a war against a country, right? If you have to liquidate millions of people to stay under a st Stalinistic dictatorship versus a Hitlerian dictatorship, is that really like a fair price? That's actually a question that isn't answered and it's just assumed, but you don't even have to go there uh, to find problems with this. First of all, in one of the interviews with Kotkin, somebody asked him that exact same question. He goes, you don't industrialize a country by liquidating millions of people, especially if you target the most high functioning, successful, smartest, productive people, which is exactly what this Stalin did. The whole process of collectivizing and de was going after the peasants who were the best, who, who were the most productive, who had the highest yields, and destroying them, and in many cases liquidating them. Uh, but it was more than that, even skilled workers. And he talks about, you know, there was a time in 1928, the Soviet Union had 110 students studying, 110 students studying you know, highly technical things like engineering. 110 for a country with 150 million people. And so they had all these foreign German, Germans, Italians, Americans who were coming to the USSR, being promised a lot of money to come and help train. But then they would go and hound these people. They'd arrest these people. They'd say, oh, you're foreign, you're, you're spies, you're bourgeoisie capitalists. And they would they they'd arrest their own citizens and put show trials with him. He talks a whole bunch about show trials put on. And it wasn't because these people actually did anything wrong. It's because in the Marxist mentality, they're class enemies. You can't trust somebody who's successful and rich and who knows what they're doing. And especially if they had been educated beforehand and had, you know, maybe a prosperous family, these people are automatically because of class consciousness to be sus suspect and to be ridiculed and even destroyed. And yet these were the only kind of people who would be necessary to bring about the industrial changes and the technical expertise that the Soviet Union needed. And yet these people were, um, were uh, you know, discriminated against horribly. And a little bit later, he hasn't talked about it in the book, this happened in the military too. And during the purges in the 30s, Stalin wiped out uh, basically the entire officer corps. The only ones who escaped were the ones who happened to be positioned far away in Siberia. Um, and this had disastrous consequences when the war actually started. And I guess this is kind of just another aside here. The idea that like it was Stalin's wisdom that that allowed Russia to win a war against Germany in 1941 is just so ludicrous on its foot. First of all, Russia is a vastly larger country than, than Germany uh, in terms of area, in terms of population, in terms of resources, vastly larger. Um, Germany was already involved in a war with major powers like the UK and de facto against the United States. And it launches into an invasion of an area that it doesn't really have the logistics to actually occupy. If you read the 10-part uh, series on Germany in the Second World War, they make it very clear in, in part four of that book, which details the initial invasion of Barbarossa, that the Wehrmacht did not have the logistical means to have full-scale occupational and, and offensive operations in all of European Russia, which is exactly what they were trying to do. And so the only country in the world during World War II that had the logistics to maybe do that would have been the United States, which of course was not invading Russia, it was Germany.
Um, this would be analogous to a, a coyote that already has one foot in a trap trying to fight a grizzly bear. And when the grizzly bear wins going, yeah, that grizzly bear has a really great trainer. No, the grizzly bear was going to win no matter what. And that's exactly what happened in World War II. The liquidation of the officer corps in the 30s made the, mil the Soviet Red Army so abysmally poor in its performance that when it invaded Finland in 1939-40, it almost lost. It was massacred. Several armies were destroyed. And that event actually is what encouraged the Nazis to invade. If you look, obviously Hitler had an idea of Lebensraum. He wanted land in the east, but he was not thinking about doing that in the course of World War II. He was thinking about that happening maybe someday. Um, but it was the weakness of the Red Army, the weakness that Stalin had created, that made him think there might actually be an opportunity here. And we can call the Soviet victory a victory if you want, but Solzhenitsyn pointed out that if this is a victory, it's worse than any defeat that's ever happened. More people were killed in the Soviet Union in that war than in any war ever, probably. There's so sometimes some of the early uh, wars in China that happened you know, a long time ago are sometimes attributed to having more ca casualties, but those are very hard to really calculate. Um, the, re the Russian army did far better in World War I than it did in World War II uh, in terms of its performance, in, in terms of resisting a German advance. Um, and I think if you look at the numbers uh, in terms of industrial output, industrialization and mod modern um, modernizing effects were happening much more steadily and much better under the Tsars than they were under the Soviets, all right? Um, to give them credit for that, to say this is some great accomplishment is ridiculous. You, by liquidating millions of high-functioning people, uh, that is ridiculous. And I actually wanted to read a little bit of a quote here from the book because I thought it was so good. I don't want you to think that like this is just my opinion and that I'm you know uh, misstating the views of Mr. Kotkin here, who I don't believe is a libertarian. I don't believe he's a free market a anarchist or anything of the stripe. But uh, we will just read right here. Scholars who argue that Stalin's collectivization was necessary in order to force a peasant country into a modern era are dead wrong. The Soviet Union, like Imperial Russia, faced an imperative to modernize in order to survive in the brutally unsentimental international order. But market systems have been shown to be fully compatible with fast-paced industrialization, including in peasant countries. Forced wholesale collectivization only seemed necessary within the straitjacket of communist ideology and its repudiation of capitalism. And economically, collectivization failed to deliver. Stalin assumed it would increase both the state's share of low-cost grain purchases and the overall size of the harvest. But although procurements doubled immediately, harvests shrank. Over the longer term, collective farming would not prove superior to large-scale capitalist farming or even to small-scale capitalist farming when the latter was provided with machinery, fertilizer, agronomy, and effective distribution. In the short term, collectivization would contribute nothing to the net Soviet in in industrial growth. Okay. Also, in the book, he relates that the collectivization that Stalin was going to use was going to be an exact copy of a farm in Montana, the largest farm in the United States at the time. Just like all the factories are based off of copies of American factories, like in South Bend or in Indiana, they actually hired the same engineer who had built those factories to come over and build them here. All their technology had people like to say, oh, this is what helped the Soviets win. It's all copied from the West, right down to the chassis on the T-34 tanks that everyone knows about, right down to the AK-47s. Those are copies of Sturmgewehrs and everything else. Uh, again, a great book on that is Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development, which, again, not only shows specifics, but also gives you the general feel. Obviously, you have to account World War One was, you know, very bad for Russia, and the Civil War was really bad for Russia, but those were really over by 1920, 1921. Uh, and the rest of the world, even though they suffered greatly through the Great War as well, saw huge increases in their industrial output throughout the 1920s. Um, you know, the United States saw the most, obviously, but you could say, well, the United States wasn't ravaged by the war, and that's true. It wasn't. But even countries like Germany or France, you know, most most of the industrial areas of France were occupied by the Germans and destroyed by the Germans during World War One, and yet France had 75% more industrial output in the mid-20s than they did in 1914. 
Whereas in the Soviet Union, you have two-thirds less than you had in 1913, even though most of their industrial base was never touched by the war. Right? The Pripyat marshes in uh, you know, Poland were not part. So this is uh, you know, clearly, clearly uh, a terrible, terrible um, you know, result in terms of how, how well things were doing. Also in terms of like worker, I mean, that's the worker's paradise, right? The conditions for workers in the Soviet Union were absolutely abysmal. If you ever read uh, Behind the Urals, which is a book by, I forget his name, Wilson or Johnson, but he was an American socialist who, you know, was so into this that he went and worked in Magnitogorsk, uh, one of Stalin's cities, the metal, metal mountain city, a uh, steel mill that was built near massive, a uh, massive steel mine, a uh, massive iron deposits and massive coal deposits. And, uh, there was no worker safety. The workers died by the hundreds, by the thousands. Uh, I mean, the railroads were were run so horribly that they would just crash into each other and, you know, a hundred people could die. And there was no second thought given about that. Um, and for all of that suffering, for all that death, they're behind everybody else anyway. Uh, so no, the killing of millions of people, the starving of millions of people, millions of people, sometimes on purpose, sometimes on accident, uh, was completely unnecessary. It was counterproductive, and of course, it was a horrible crime. But it was completely in concert with socialist beliefs. Uh, Stalin was, again, a dedicated, dedicated Marxist-Leninist. He believed in this stuff all the time. He read it all the time. Whenever he talked in private, that's how he spoke. There was no, There's no point where he breaks the fourth wall and goes, I'm really just doing this because... I only love power, and I'm just using, you know, Marxist-Leninism as a as a as a mask for my, you know, avaricious desire to dominate. No, he never says that. He never acted that way. He everything he did, he did things even like he points out, collectivizing agriculture was something that weakened his dictatorship. But he did it anyway because he thought it was it was within the as he says in the quote that I read within the straitjacket of communist ideology, it was completely necessary. So anyway, it's a really good book. I recommend anyone who's interested in Stalin or the general history of the transition from the czarist Russia to the Soviet Union to read this book. And the later editions will obviously cover different periods of history, including World War II, which I think will be very interesting. Uh, and yeah, I thought it was a pretty pretty good read. And I've been waiting to do a video until I finished it. I finished it yesterday, so I figured I'd do a video today. So I'll probably do a few other videos soon. But until then, I'll talk to you all later.